screen and getting everything turned on here, I want to say that Brother Paul is my kind of song leader. It's got four verses that are there for a purpose. All right. I began by saying that I appreciate the opportunity to be here and the invitation extended to me by Michael to come and be a part of this lectureship. Appreciate the congregation here. The work that you've done down through the years is well known throughout the brotherhood. The stand you've taken, you'd be commended for that. I appreciate the hospitality that's been shown me since I've been here this week. It will eventually come on. Okay. All right. All right, there we go. <clears throat> the topic that I've been assigned this morning is, as on the screen there, is by God able to deliver thee. This is taken from a passage in Daniel 6 and verse 20. We find there these words recorded. It says, And he came to the dead, and he cried with a loud voice unto God. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions. So we think about Daniel and the lions then. This is one account in the Bible that I, I suppose is probably as well known as any account that is there. Our young people, our children learn about Daniel and the lions then from young age and they, they grow and they hear about Daniel and the lions then. But sometimes I think perhaps we forget just exactly who Daniel spent the night with. I think we need to remember that Daniel... Spend the night with some creatures such as you see before you here this morning. Normally, when someone was thrown into a den of lions, before they reached the bottom of the cave, they were already devoured. Friends, as we think about this, we need to remember, and especially as we're teaching our young people about Daniel and the lions then, to tell them more than just the account that we're studying here this morning, this part of the account, but to tell them about the life of Daniel. This isn't an account that's in the Bible just for children either. There are so many things about Daniel's life that should be encouraging to Christians. Things that will help us to become stronger Christians to show us how we ought to be. How is it that a man could walk into a den of lions with the full faith that if he were delivered that was fine and if he wasn't delivered it was fine also? It was because he was a servant of the Most High God. We think about Daniel, there's some questions that come to mind. We want to know we want to know, first of all, why it is that Daniel was in the lion's den. And I want us to discuss that for a few moments here. But first, let's look at some things about Daniel's life. And, and it's really a wonder, how could this man be placed in this position? First of all, Daniel was a man who was preferred by the king. If you'll notice in your Bibles, Daniel chapter 6, the first three verses of this chapter tell us that Darius the king had set Daniel in a position as, as one of the three presidents over the area. And it says there in verse 3 that Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king th set, thought to set him above the, about the whole realm. This tells us something about Daniel. And I believe as we think about Daniel and the way that the king thought about him, it shows us how we ought to be in his life as we go about working in different positions that we're in, or whether we're uh, employers or employees, however it might be, in living the Christian life before the world, there's some things that Daniel can show us. When the king looked at Daniel, he saw a man that was dedicated. He saw a man that was reliable. He saw a man that was honest. And you look at these three characteristics. Daniel was set in a position so that the king would, as verse 2 says, that the king would have no damage. He would suffer no damage. When the king looked at Daniel, he saw a man that he knew was reliable. He could count on this man. If he told Daniel to do thus or so, he knew that Daniel would take care of that. As long as he didn't go against what Daniel knew that God wanted him to do, Daniel proceeded to do exactly what he was supposed to do. Daniel not only was honest, he was reliable, and he was dedicated. When we think about Daniel being dedicated, we think about him being dedicated to God. But I'd like us also to think about the life that Daniel had lived thus far as it was recorded in the Scriptures. Whatever position he was put in, he did the best he could do. He did everything that he could do to make sure that, that position was taken care of, whatever task was set before him. And because of that, he was well thought of by those he served. But there again, we remember that he served them and was dedicated to them, honest and reliable, as long as it didn't go against what God had for him to do. 
Well, not only was Daniel preferred by the king, Daniel was a religious man. And this is something I think is very important for us to see as we think about Daniel. You recall how that Daniel, from before the beginning of his captivity, Daniel had been faithful to God. You think about Daniel being taken captive, a young man, and taken into the land of Babylon. But friends, I don't believe he became a follower of God on the road to Babylon. I believe he was a follower of God before he ever left the land of Israel. Turn back to the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'm sure we're familiar with this passage. But here's a passage that I believe, although it's not written in the Word, I believe it's implied that Daniel's parents at least taught Daniel about God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Now let's notice this. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk with them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Friends, Daniel knew about God a long time before he was taken captive. I think this tells us something here that as preachers and leaders of congregations that we today need to make sure that our the people with whom we're working understand that God needs to be in the lives of our children. I was privileged to study with a young couple several years ago at Richmond Hill, and they both obeyed the gospel. They've been married now for about four or five years, and we don't have elders at Richmond Hill, and I've told them for four or five years to go home and make elders. Well, about two months, a month ago, they had their first child. The child was born on Wednesday. Sunday morning, you know where the child was? He was in Bible class. And he went to Bible class, and the mother went to her class. Usually some ladies open their mouths and scream about that time. But the baby went to class, and the mother went to class, so the mother got a break and got to study God's Word. The child went to class. What did he learn that day? I don't know that he learned anything. But by example, and by the way, Vacation Bible School started that night, and he attended every night, and he went to class every night. Friends, this young man is going to be raised knowing that God comes first. They're teaching him, or going to teach him about God and what God has done for them. So again, Daniel, I do not believe Daniel became a follower of God on the road to Babylon. But Daniel was a religious man. When he was first captive in Daniel chapter 1, we find here where Daniel did not want to follow the prescribed menu provided by the king. You call how that Daniel, Michelle, Hannah, and Azariah were the young men that the eunuch had charge of. Now they were chosen, verse 3 says, because they were well favored and skillful in wisdom when they were among these children. And the prince of the eunuchs was given a menu to give them some of the king's meat and the wine that the king drank. Notice verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. And so he made a request to the eunuch. He requested that he not be, they not be made to partake of these things. The eunuch was afraid. He said, I'm afraid that if I allow you to do this, you won't look as well as those who are taking the king's portion. Daniel said, let's have a test. He said, for a period of ten days, give us vegetables or pulse and water. And then compare us to those others. Well, you recall how that this happened and that they were better looking, better fit than those that were given the king's meat and the king's drink. But now let's think about that for a moment. Here was a young man taken captive, and here he is before the king, given an order by the king, and he says, I, I'd rather not do that. Let us do this. Friends, that took courage for him to do that. But he realized he would be violating what God desired him to do, and so he chose to make a stand. And friends, we need to teach our children that there are times when they need to make a stand also. And so Daniel took the king's, uh, did not partake of the king's food, but rather chose to do what God would have him to do. And then in Daniel chapter 2, we find again where Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream. And Daniel was able to help him in coming to an interpretation of that dream, but he gave the glory to God. 
You recall that Nebuchadnezzar had had the dream and we all understand the dream was the great image. Nebuchadnezzar got up, he was troubled, and he called for all of his wise men to come and to tell him about the dream. And they said, well, tell us what the dream is. He said, no, you tell me what the dream is. He said, they said, no, you tell us what the dream is, we'll explain it to you. Nebuchadnezzar said, no, you tell me what I dreamed, and then you tell me what it, what it meant. Well, since they couldn't do that, you recall how the Bible says that he was filled with wrath and sought to kill all the wise men of Babylon. But Daniel heard about this and he goes to the captain of the king's guard and, and he tells them, what, ask them what's the hurry. Verse 15, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Verse 16, Daniel went into the king that he would give him some time. Notice what Daniel did. And we're talking about Daniel being a religious man. Daniel goes and gets Hannah and Mishael and Azariah. Verse 17, his companions, what do they do? They pray about it. They go to God in prayer to pray about this situation knowing that their life is at stake, but knowing they can go to God and God will be there for them. Friends, we need to remember that. We need to pray all the time, not just in times of, of distress, but pray always, as Paul said. But friends, when things are troubling us in our lives, we need, need not forget that we need to be prayerful people. And so we find that they... Pray to God, and Daniel goes in before before the king to tell him the the answer to uh, to his dream. Verse twenty seven. And Daniel, in his presence, of the king said, "The secret thing which to be demanded cannot be the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot show unto the king." But notice verse twenty eight of chapters two. He said, "But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets." And make it known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Friends, Daniel went into the king a perfect time for him to take the glory upon himself to say, look what I can tell you. But rather than do that, he said, there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. Daniel was a religious man. And then in Daniel chapter 5, we recall how that Daniel, at the time of the, just before Babylon was to be conquered by the Medes, that Daniel interpreted the handwriting on the wall. You recall how there in chapter 5, Belshazzar had had a great feast, and he had a drunken feast, and he had called for the things of the temple, the vessels brought out of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar, and they were using them there in that feast. Well, as they were doing this, you recall the four fingers of the man's hand that began to write on the wall. The Bible says the king's knees knocked together. He was afraid. He wanted to know what this meant, and so he called for his wise men. They couldn't tell him what it meant. And then the queen mother went to the king and said, There's a man in the kingdom by the name of Daniel. He can do this. They called for Daniel. Daniel came before the king. You recall how that Daniel, as he came before the king, he told him he would be able to tell him the interpretation, but he told him some history. He told him about Nebuchadnezzar and how Nebuchadnezzar had thought too much of himself and because of that God had showed him that there was a God in heaven. And he explained to him that because of what he was doing with the vessels from the temple, that God was displeased. The writing on the wall, he said the interpretation of the thing is this, verse 26. The writing meaning meaning tickle your farson. He said, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it, Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. The kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Friends, Daniel was a religious man. It showed all the time that he was in Babylon that we have history of. It showed that he was a religious man. Why is this man who is so religious, why is he now placed in, in the lion's den? Well, the third reason we see here, all right, Michael, I've done something, what I'll do now. I don't need a flag today. All right. Thank you. Not only was he a religious man, but Daniel's peers were jealous of his preferred status. This hits more to the point of why he was put in the den of lions. Daniel's peers were jealous of him. Notice, they knew what kind of man he was. He knew that only, they knew that only by using Daniel's religion 
Could they find any way to accuse him before the king? That says volumes about his character and his example he set before them. And so, knowing that the only way they can find something against Daniel is his religion, they form a plot against Daniel. Notice, if you will, in Daniel chapter 6, beginning at verse 6, the presidents, the princes assembled together the king, and thus said unto King Darius, King Darius, live forever. Can't you see them all these men going into the king and telling him these things? He said, All the presidents the king of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, the captives have consulted together to make a royal decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast in the den of lions. Can't you see how proud the king must have been? These people think I'm something. And that's a pretty good idea. And so it says that wherefore King Darius signed the writing and the decree. But notice, they said, Now O king established the decree and assigned the writing that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. So the plot is set. The king has gone on and signed the decree. Well, we said before that Daniel was a religious man, so now let's notice what is Daniel's reaction to the decree. What's he going to do? He has a choice to make, and he knows that his life can be taken from him. Well, the Bible says that Daniel went, as he always had. He knew that it had been signed. He knew it was a law. He went into his chamber, which faced Jerusalem. He kneeled down, his windows being open. He kneeled down three times a day and prayed and gave thanks to God before his God as he did a four times. Daniel knew what the law said. Friends, this says something right here that we need to pay special attention to. It says right here that Daniel knew this is what the government wants me to do, but here is what God wants me to do, and I'll serve God. Friends, in the next few years in our country, I fear that the church is going to face this same type of persecution. There are laws right now trying to be passed by those who, uh, homosexuals for instance, that are going to cause problems in the church. The women's rights group is going to cause problems in the church, and we're going to have to make a decision of what we're going to do. I see more problem with the homosexual situation than I do uh, coming up than I do with the women's, but I know that the, the homosexuals are trying to get it so that they can marry. And if they come into the church and want to be married, we'd have to marry them according if they pass the law. Friends, we're going to have to make a decision. We need to be sure that we understand and have the same character that Daniel had so that when the time comes, we can tell them that we'll serve God, not man. But friends, as we think about Daniel, Daniel didn't change what he did. And he didn't make a big show about what he was doing. This is what he had always done. And so he goes and he says his prayers to God just as he always has. Well, he fell into the trap, the enemies think. We think about it. As much as the king desired to change what had been done, he couldn't change it, he couldn't spare Daniel. When you read the account here, you find the king had a great love for Daniel. Not only was he dedicated, honest, and reliable, I believe he was actually a friend of the king. From what we read there in the next passage, we find that the king worked as hard as he could to try to get Daniel out of this, but there was no way to do it. Beginning in verse 14 of chapter 6, read with me. So the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself. Have you ever found that situation in your life? You've done something and you wish you hadn't have done it, but it's too late. Friends, that also tells us something. There are things we may do in this life. Sins we may commit, we have to suffer the consequences. And so we need to make sure that we are careful in the way that we live our lives. But it said the king was displeased with himself and set his heart to deliver Daniel. Notice this. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. The king of the nation worked as hard as he could to deliver this man from a punishment that he's the one that signed the law. The king thought a lot of Daniel. But the enemies of Daniel reminded the king. He said, you know, the law, they said the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree or statute which the king established may be changed. The king has no choice now. In verse 16 it says, As Daniel was being cast into the dead lines, the, God, the king said to Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. 
It sounds like the king had some faith in God, doesn't it? Well, as we continue studying about this, we find that the king that night couldn't sleep. He didn't call for anything to help make him sleep, but he waited for the morning light to come. In an audience of this size, of this age, I would say that many of us have, have had several nights in our lives where we just couldn't wait for the sun to come up. And it seemed like it took forever. Well, here's the king. He can't wait for the morning to come so that he can go and, and check on his friend Daniel. And so he hurries in the morning, he goes down, and he asks the question that we're discussing this morning. Oh, Daniel, servant living God is thy God whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee. Let's look at some lessons from this. First of all, in what the king said, we see the frailty of human nature. Notice, the king doubted the power of God to deliver Daniel. As he was having him thrown in, he said, Daniel, your God will be able to save you. But when he got up the next morning, he came and trembling, and you could almost hear the fear in his voice as he says, Daniel, was your God able to deliver thee? You see, he doubted the power of God. Friends, this is a problem that exists today. He wanted to believe God would save him, but his faith was weak. We find the same problem today with many Christians. We find there are many Christians today who doubt God's power. They doubt God's power to do what He says. Friends, God has made promises, and His promises He will keep. They're sure. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Friends, we must remember that God means what He says. In the years that I've been preaching, I've had people come to me and say, Riley, I feel like I'm losing my faith because I don't feel like I... If, I don't feel like I can be saved. Now friends, let's think about that. They're doubting God's power. God's Word tells them, if you obey Me, I will forgive you of your sins. If you live a faithful Christian life, heaven can be your home. God's Word says that. And some of these people have said, well, but I feel like I, I just I can't know that. Friends, the Bible tells us we can know that. We'll look at that in just a moment. But if you find someone with a weak faith, what do you do to them? What do you do with them? Well, first of all, we need to instruct them to put their nose back in God's Word. Romans 10, 17 tells us, So in faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. If my faith is getting weak, I need to study God's Word more than what I've been studying. And if I study that Word, that's going to lead me to do the things that God would have me to do. As I study, I'm going to increase the responsibility that I have because the more knowledge I have, the more responsibility that's given to me. James had something to say about this in James chapter 1. He said, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But notice the next verse. He said, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. After they began to study the word, we also need to tell them that they need to go about doing what God's word tells them to do. There are works to do in any congregation. There are visits that need to be made. There are those who need help. There are those who need to be taught the gospel. These are things those people need to be involved in. God's promises are sure. He wants us all to be saved. We can know. We can know that we're saved. God's Word tells us. All right. This is a foreign object in my hand. Don't touch the backside. We can know that we're saved. First John chapter two, verses three and five. Apologize for the mistakes there. Hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Many times, my friends, those who come and say they have a weak faith, those who, who say, I don't know that I've been saved, that I am saved. It may be, and many times it is, because they're not doing what they know they ought to be doing. And that's why they feel that they, they can't be sure they're saved. And so as they go back to God's Word and study it, if they'll come to the knowledge of what God desires them to do and follow it, they can know that they're saved if we keep His commandments. But who so keepeth His Word in Him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in Him. Friends, God keeps His promises. And He has promised salvation to all them that obey Him. 
and will do it faithfully. But secondly, we also see a Christian example is important. We think about Daniel and the things that he did. The king knew of Daniel's devotion to God. Do you notice that when Daniel was brought before the king, we don't read where he was questioned about what he had done? The king knew that Daniel was a servant of God. And he knew what Daniel would be doing. When he heard what had happened, it said he was displeased with himself. Friends, the king knew of Daniel's devotion to his God. Daniel could have not prayed for 30 days, but he did. Why? Because that's the one he knew he was supposed to be doing. Daniel also could have shut his doors and closed his windows, but he didn't do that either. Why? He wasn't ashamed to show them that he was a servant of God. Daniel was setting an example before those around about him. Friends, every Christian needs to remember the importance of example. The example that we set before others. Notice what our Lord said. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, beginning, where He said, You're the salt of the earth, but the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salt? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and trodden in the foot of men. Notice what He says. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither the men light a candle and put it in our bushel, but on a candlestick, and give it light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Friends, the Christian example is one that may be the only gospel, the only Bible that people in the world read. There may be those that you can never get to open the Bible for years because they simply don't want to have anything to do with God's Word. But they see our example. They see what we do every day. They see how devoted we are to God. They see the good that comes to those who follow God. And they become interested. They want to know more about it. The example we set before our children is another thing we need to look at here. As I said earlier, I believe Daniel's parents, at least somewhere Daniel, I believe from his parents, got a knowledge of God and to be faithful to God. His dedication shows that in his life. Our children need to be taught from the womb that they are to be followers of God, that God comes first in their life. Our example is so important to those in the world. Our example needs to be such that Christ is sitting in our life no matter what or where we are or what we're doing. On that occasion I was talking with an elder of a congregation. The elder told me that we went, he went on vacation, that you took a vacation from the Lord also. That you don't go to church when you're on vacation. We were discussing the fact that he had missed some Bible studies Wednesday evening services to do some things there in the community. Of course, you know what the next Sunday morning lesson was about. But friends, where, does those, where do those ideas, where do they come? How does anyone think that we can take a vacation from God? We can't take a vacation from God. Who can you influence today in your life to serve God? How many doors of opportunity will come our way today to teach someone about God? If we live like the world, we don't set the proper example before others, then we ought to be like the salt and throw it out. But you see, our Lord is merciful and He'll give us opportunity to repent of that. To study His Word and know to do better. Christian example is important. As Daniel's peers knew when Daniel prayed, our neighbors know when we're supposed to be at worship. I wish the members of all the congregations that we work with would, would understand this. How are we going to go next door and try to encourage our neighbor to obey the gospel, to, to come to services with us if they know half the time we, we're not there? It won't happen. It won't happen. Our example set before those around about us is so vitally important. So we learned that there is a frailty of human nature. A Christian example is important. But we also see, friends, that God is able to deliver thee. Daniel was delivered from the lions. Verses 21 and 22, Daniel's answer to the king. He said, My God has sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not hurt me. For so much as before him innocent was found in me, and also before the O king have done no hurt. Friends, God was able to deliver Daniel from those lions. You ever thought about Daniel in the lions then? What he did all night? I 
wonder sometimes, did he reach over and try to pet one of them? I suspect probably he was praying to God and giving thanks. I don't know that. But friends, I know Daniel was in that lion's den. I know God delivered him. He shut the mouths of the lions. I know that Daniel was delivered because of his love and his devotion to God. Friends, God can deliver us from the lion today. But we have to put our faith and trust in Him and obey Him. 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. No, he, he's not like those lions we saw in the first of the presentation. No. It might be better perhaps if he were. But because he's not seen as that, so many people ignore this verse and walk out into the world with their eyes closed to anything and everything and they're overcome. And because of that, they're not delivered. Because they're not turning to God. Friends, if we'll take the characteristics that Daniel had in his life and apply them to our lives, we can know that God will deliver us. If we obey the gospel in their faithful lives, as did Daniel, God will keep His promises. God keeps His promises either way. But friends, we can't expect God to do what God has said He'll do for us as far as saving us if we don't live for Him. We won't be able to face some of the things in this life and be triumphant over the temptations that come our way unless we're willing to live a life as Daniel lived. No matter what comes our way, God comes first. No matter what happens in our life, we're going to set the example before others that God is important to us. The question was asked, Is thy God able to deliver thee? Well, friends, the only answer that we can give today is yes, He is. God is able to deliver us. We must put our faith and our trust in Him and obey Him. Is thy God able to deliver thee? Friends, there's nothing that can come against us that we cannot defeat if we are with God. Thank you.